Um, yeah, thanks for waiting. Somebody snagged my coffee. I was, I was kind of running late. I was going like, oh, I need a coffee. I need a coffee uh, for coffee and concepts. Ran over to Starbucks, did a mobile order, but somebody mistook their order for mine. Hence, um, I was late. Uh, a friend of mine pointed out recently that every time something happens in my life, I always explain it to anybody, even if it's just somebody who I'm talking to in the street or like I'm in a shop and I don't have my credit card I find myself telling them why I don't have my credit card so you don't really want to know my problems with Starbucks but there you go um so this morning uh for the coffee and concepts I thought I would you know just talk a little bit more about what I was touching on in the last seminar um and uh you know then we'll open it up uh the theme of desire and religion particularly Christianity uh is going to be the, the kind of dominant theme from really last month to Christmas. I think that's going to be the kind of the thing that we're looking at, especially with uh, Richard Boothby. And I've got Richard, he's going to be doing some conversations with me for, for Patreon. So he's, um, uh, we're going to go over obviously his book, but he's going to also be part of some conversations, which I'm excited about. So desire is a biggie for the next, say, six months. Um, and so I'll say a couple of kind of provisional things and see where we get to. Uh, the first might be, I might talk about why is desire so important? Uh, like not just, of course, desire is important, but, but why might it be central? Why might it be central to who we are as subjects, who we are as human beings and central to uh, religion and to Christianity in particular, uh, which is kind of the, the focus. Um, so we can't answer all of that in 15 minutes, obviously, but I'm going to give a couple of like provisional thoughts on that. Um, I'll start by saying like there is an, in, oh, and Hegel was probably the first philosopher to systematically put desire at the center of what it is to be human. Uh, we could probably put desire and language as these two central components to the extent that if ever we find life of elsewhere that has language, and desire, uh, they will be at least human. Like we are human animals, so we're animals and we're human. Whatever we find will be human and, you know, whatever else. Uh, so central to being a subject is, is what we're doing right now, language and desire, and they are um, interconnected. Uh, and desire, why can we connect desire and religion? Well, if very broadly speaking, I provisionally define the religious attitude as an attitude towards something otherwise than being, otherwise than materiality. So to be religious uh, or to have a religious orientation or religious interest is to, is to say that there is, and I have to be careful with my words, so I want to be as broad as possible here. I could be narrow and just say you believe there's something other other than materiality, right? You're not a materialist, but that isn't quite true because you can be a materialist and not believe that everything's reducible to the two material things. So um, being careful with my words, I would say it's an orientation to something that, that we cannot touch, taste, see, or feel. We can't, that is, that is not something that we can register on machines. There's some, there's some dimension of transcendence that we orient ourselves towards. So if we, if we take that, broadly speaking, as a kind of religious orientation, and we, then we can fill that in in lots of different ways, then desire has a very religious dimension to it because desire is an affect uh, that is that it circles around lack, around something that you don't have, around something that you can't touch, taste, see, feel, right? Um, to desire something is to not have it. Desire is a type of affect oriented around a nothingness, a lack. Very simply, you desire a cup of coffee because you don't have a cup of coffee, and then when you get it, you can enjoy it. Um, and then just to complicate that slightly more is you can desire things that you have, but the desire is still oriented around some transcendent dimension of what you have. 
So for example, um, the brewery next door to me, I'm going to do an event, by the way, on the 25th of September for anyone who's in LA. I'm going to get a musician to play, maybe Elliot to do something. I'm going to do a talk. So I'll, I'll be putting out information about that, uh, you know, as soon as possible, but I, I'm 90% 90, 90 sure I'm going to do it. Um, but that brewery, uh, the people who own it desire it still. They have it and they desire it. But what they desire could be described as what they're going to do with what they have. Like they, they're thinking about expanding or putting new beers on the list or doing graphic design work to change something. So what they have, there's still a dimension of not having within it. There's still a dimension of, of, of the to come, the promise of something possible. If they, um, you know, in a thought experiment, got everything they wanted in that, that brewery, there would be a stopping up of desire and uh, they probably lose a lot of interest. You can be in a city, so you have the city, but what you desire is the parts of the city you still haven't seen, the things that you can still learn about. Um, so desire, even when you desire something you have, you love somebody, you desire them, but the other person is a transcendent other. There's a dimension of them that you can never grasp. And that's really the part that attaches you and, and that part you can call their desire, right? The part of them that is lacking, you desire their desire. You desire a part of them that, that is not just what they are, what they do, but there's, there's an extra je ne sais quoi, something about the other you can't put your finger on and that animates desire. So in a very, very basic sense, if you go, oh, if religion is an orientation, to a type of transcendence, either a lack or an excess that we can't grasp, then, oh yeah, that, that seems to connect with what desire is in a very simple level, which is oriented around something that's lacking, that's not there, that we don't have. And that seems central to human beings. Freud called this drive, right? Or drive is connected to it, I should say. Like an instinct is something you, you're hungry and you eat, and then you're satisfied. So instinct is also driven by a not having, but then you can have it and you're satisfied. Drive is kind of oriented around lack as such and never is sated. So an animal might want a habitat uh, to live in, but as soon as it builds its nest or digs the hole, it's happy, it stops. But if you've got a drive for a house, you'll always be moving. You'll be maybe always be thinking about an extension. You'll always be thinking about getting two houses or three houses, right? So the, the drive, it's not just an instinct to say, I want a place with a roof over my head. There is this continual dissatisfaction that, that's not just wanting a place to live. There's something more going on. Um, so desire in a, in a very secular way is orientation towards lack. And uh, it's central to, to, be, to being a subject. And I'll just talk a little bit about that. Mm. Um, one theory, one way of going about this is to say that, uh, how do you say this? Yeah, the baby, the first thing they want is the breast or the bottle, right? They just have, and the can calls this a demand. They have a demand, they're hungry, and they want that hunger fulfilled. So there's a presence and absence of the breast that's there to nurse them, and then not there, there and not there. Now, the child always experiences some sort of lag between demanding and having, right? The mother is not always there, is distracted doing other things, or the mother uh, reads the baby's tiredness as hunger or sickness as tiredness or whatever it is. So there's kind of mismatch between the demand of the child and the response of the parent. But because of our brains and the structure of our brains, um, the child is smart enough to quickly learn that there is a giver of the gift, right? There is, there is an agent, there is you know, it's not just the demand and it gets what it wants. There's some other subject, 
that is involved in this, right? Who is there to give and to not give. And the, the infant moves from the mere demand for the bottle to a desire for the other and a desire for the other's desire. Uh, one of the ways this works out is the child realizes that they are desirable to the other, the other is responding to them and they are the object of desire and they want that, right? And so there's this thing where you start to de desire, say not the object, the bottle, but you actually desire the other's desire. You desire to be the answer to their desire. And then the, the next step is kind of, which is the name of the father, which is basically where the infant realizes that the mother has other desires than the child. So in a you know, nuclear family, the idea is you're, that you, the mother and the infant are joined together in this very intense, almost like fused, fused together. And as you know, I was talking to a friend of mine, he, she talked about when she was breastfeeding, um, I, I should know this, but I don't, we're not kids and a guy or whatever, but she was talking about this, this sheer experience of fusion and the, uh, the chemical oxy, whatever, oxytonin or whatever, the, the, the brain releases that experience. This prof so this is a profound experience that you can feel when you're breastfeeding a fusion and, and love. Ox oxytocin. Ah, thank you. Thank you, Courtney. And, some, and uh, whoever spoke there as well. Um, but there's, so there's this almost to the sense that you can't talk about a mother and a child without, you know, with, separately. They're so unified. And then the name of the father is the name of the any object that the mother desires that is other than the child, right? So the name of the father isn't actually the father, but it can be. It actually and it often is in a nuclear family. The infant, the first thing the infant realizes, oh, oh the mother loves daddy, right? So that, that's it. But it could be mother loves her job or her religion or... And the, the mother could be the father, you know, the father could be the primary caregiver. And the fa so you see, it's a structure, not, not, we don't get caught up in who occupies, the, you know, the, on the chessboard, we don't have to be occupied with uh, what the pieces look like, but rather the rules of the game. Um, but this is the point of castration where the child realizes, oh, the mother has other desires. And then the infant begins to desire those other things and desire then kind of is let loose is set free into the world child starts to desire what the mother desires where her gaze alights upon called joint attention there's a point where an infant is able to see what you're looking at was able to kind of realize that your attention is going somewhere else and the infant will look at what you're looking at they won't look at you they'll look at where your gaze is landing and they'll become interested in what what your attention is landing on. Um, okay, so all of that is to say that um, very early on, we become really interested in the desire of the other. And it feels substantive to us and it feels like we can be the answer to it and then maybe something else can be the answer to it and whatever. And fantasy is the earliest, and I, you know, the, the, what, our, what our fantasies are now, but start off, you could say, as the answer to the question of what does the other desire and what does the other desire of me? So weirdly, you could say that your fantasies aren't so much what you desire, but what you think the other desires, how you become desirable to the other. Because um, the, the, the infant is, you know, fantasizing and asking questions as to how can I, how can I be desirable to the other? Um, now, uh, I was on The Minimalist the other week and I was, it hasn't come out yet, the episode, but I was talking to them about, I might've mentioned this actually in the talk, that often we, when we meet somebody who we fall in love with, we might feel that they bring out in us something that was there that we never knew about. It's going, oh, I finally found myself and finding you, I find myself. You know, you brought out something in me that lay dormant. But in this theory, it's, it's slightly different. And again, there's a religious dimension to this is that when you enter into a new relationship like that, you're born again. It's not so much that you, are, you discover 
who you were in your substance eternally is that every person can be someone who rebirths you you become something new something different bringing out desires in you that not were there lying dormant but in in a sense um are given to you by the other they're gifted to you and so the other becomes this instrument of your transformation your reconfiguration your rebirth <laughs> um, and it's so intoxicating sometimes that it feels like oh you finally find my true self when you know according to, to Lacan it would be well it's actually something more beautiful I think which is you've given me a new self you know you've given me something new are you are you have are you've made me born again into something different um that I would never have become if I hadn't met you uh and within this vision then we become who we are through encountering the desire of the other which is the lack of the other what the other doesn't have we find ourselves trying to find a place within that lack we find ourselves fantasizing about what the other wants and this recreates us and this transforms us and it changes us and so i'm linked into your lack and you're linked into my lack if this wasn't the case this is one of the issues i have with liberalism right liberalism has two basic premises like what well, the first is um that we are atomized individuals right we are in private individuals who participate in society right um but in this idea is you know you're not that's a bad premise to start with is like we are completely intertwined in terms of the desire of those around us our parents our siblings uh, the people we engage with so there is no atomized private self that enters the world and communicates with others uh you get into all sorts of problems then as well you get again the solipsism is how can i prove there's anybody else in the world right because i'm starting off with the premise that there's me and there's the external world so how can i really know anybody else's mind that's the other thing how can i walk in your shoes how can i know your lived experience because it's yours it's not mine i can speak my truth you can speak your truth but if you reject that premise and go there is no my truth or your truth in isolation from how that truth is formed and reformed through relationships it it just kind of shows that we are there's like a web the the world community is like a web um of interconnections um and so desire gives us to ourselves helps us become something helps us reimagine ourselves and reinvent ourselves and then i'll finish with one final thought then of how this connects to religion or the idea of god one way you could maybe describe god is that god is the name for this transcendence this lack this this otherwise than being that doesn't just dwell within us but dwells within everything that there's a certain sense that the universe couldn't create desiring creatures if if in a sense there wasn't a kind of lack or crack or um asymmetry within the universe itself and god could be seen as the name for that otherwise than being what cannot be grasped and in traditional christianity that substantive uh there is a substantive otherness that we cannot grasp but it doesn't need to be it just needs to be a sense in which the universe is like swiss cheese it, it has holes within it um and there's the this very small set of russian orthodox russians who don't have icons what they do is they cut a hole in the wall of their home so i've said i, do, I can't remember what direction it's facing cut a hole and they pray to the hole itself the gap itself and they're called the hole worshippers um very small sect I, don't, I, I could hardly find anything about them i wrote about them in my very first book but um i you know all i can find is like a paragraph on them so i guess they're a very small group but i really like that that their icon was literally a gap a space um and i don't think this is very far away from simone bay i think this is kind of in sync with how simone bay thinks about god 
Okay, I'll stop there because I've been yammering on. And does anybody want to come in with any thoughts, questions, or comments? Anything? And I'll look at the chat box as well here. So, Pete, I, um, I had a real experience with this the other day. I went to a friend's house and she has a two year old, and she's a school teacher. She's switching to a new computer program at work, and she's like, just for like two hours, can you keep him busy so that I can really focus on my computer and fixing my class? And I was like, absolutely, you know? So she's doing that and he's throwing an absolute fit. And I took him outside, you know, brought him back. He keeps going back and clinging to the mother. And then she finally figured it out. She's like, good, I'm done. And she goes over and sits in the rocking chair and holds out his hand and he doesn't run to her. He runs to the computer. Oh, oh wow. And then, yeah. And she was so upset. And then she's like, wait a minute, this is what you've been talking to me about, Nicole, about the desire of the mother and how it's transferred to the computer now. And I was like, it has, you know, and it, it was just really to see such a very stark uh, example of that was really powerful. Oh, that, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. That, that's yeah. what we were talking about last week or two weeks ago is that, um, you know, when we were talking about fantasies that somebody might like their desires for the other, and then it kind of latches on to the other's fantasy itself. Like it moves, desire moves onto other objects. So very, very good. So that was the name of the father. That computer was a type of name of the father, yeah. Oh yeah, Sarah's saying, what's the second premise of liberalism? Um, so I say like the second premise of liberalism is globalism. Um, like it doesn't, liberalism as a, as a politics. Oh, well, yeah. Uh, I'd say atomism, globalism, and democracy um, are probably like the three. Um, uh, I've added a third one there. Obviously, I said two, but now I'm thinking about it. <laughs> um, uh, one of my it's one of my main issues with neoliberalism in America is that um, uh, is that there is a real global globalist tendency uh, that I think is seen in NATO, um, and where you kind of want the whole world to have the same uh, values um, and of course capitalism okay? uh, you know and these aren't all bad or whatever but yeah atomism capitalism democracy and globalism are generally I've added another one if I keep thinking about it, I'll add more but they seem like the four biggies at the moment <laughs> yeah. Um, oh yeah Tara asked me to um, to met, say a little bit more about Simone Bay yeah I would love to um, some of you will know this because we've actually done a fair bit of Simone Bay at times. Uh, well, particularly in the Atheism for Lent, she's somebody we've looked at. Um, and maybe we've got a couple of talks, maybe not. But Simone Bay, uh, very famously, I'll do this quickly because I'll say some of you will know this, but uh, you know, she had she was she said, What does the miser lose when when he loses his treasure? And she's thinking about Aesop's fable, probably, where a miser loses his treasure, it's stolen, and he's really upset but he doesn't spend it. He never uses the money. So, you know, why is he upset with losing something that he never really had? Right? And Simone Bay says, well, the miser has this kind of orbit around this treasure, neither spending it nor losing it. Um, desire is kept alive through the miser's distance from what they have. And Simone Bay kind of said that that, uh, God is a, is a type of miser's treasure in a way, is that, that the universe itself, you have to be able to orient yourself to something that you don't have. And that's God, that's what we call God, is God is, is that ultimate treasure that we cannot possess. We possess and don't possess at the same time. And that possession and not possession is a type of quantum dimension of reality. So there's a quantum dimension of reality between having and not having. And the problem with the miser is um, he, the treasure isn't this ultimate having and not having. You can spend it and you can lose it. But for the, the spiritual or religious individual, they can orient themselves towards something that they can never grasp and yet never escape from. And, and that, that is what opens up desire. And that was what opens up subjectivity. Um, and she says, you know, that's her kind of name for God. It's own way is quite difficult to read at times. It's very fragmented. So but that's definitely uh, 
I think there is some of our really perceptive writings. Kate, I had a thought about, um, you had early on, you said something about religion being, looking at my notes, <laughs> uh, something that says there's, there is something other than materiality. And um, I just wanted to add to that and see what you thought. Um, I was thinking of Rob Bell's definition of religion. Um, where he looks at the, um, the etymology of the word, and it's related to the Latin um, legio, meaning something that holds you together. It's where we get ligament from. So uh, he kind of defines religion as something that we, uh, we take into ourselves in order to hold us together. And this could be you know, what we think of as a religion, um, you know, a take Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, whatever. Um, but it could also be, you know, what holds me together? Oh, it's my family or it's X, Y, Z concepts or it's money or whatever that we use those things to hold us together. And that's our religion. Yeah, it's very interesting. Um, that uh, so two things. One is I really liked Rob's, um, uh, there's the last tour he did, and see his most recent one, last tour he did um, was very much about, I know a lot of his work has been about kind of how to open yourself up to um, really a dimension of reality that is beyond the mundane, right? There's our see and seeing that dimension within the mundane. So I really like that kind of stuff he's been doing. But in the end, in relation to what you're saying there, um, that's great because it kind of brings up then what Tillich would say, which is now you, you can define good religion and kind of bad religion. So, so what Paul Tillich says is he says, putting it in the language that you've just mentioned, he says like, if you're held together by something that, is material so for example you believe in the government your government is your religion right so it's like my government right or wrong da, da, da. he would tell would call that demonic religion it's where something finite is taken the place of the infinite something not ultimate is taken the place of the ultimate but if you believe in so uh, yeah to like if you believe in america if you're american believe in america uh right or wrong you believe in america he would call that idolatry but if you believe in america and you say well america stands for the values of democracy and justice and you know you know equality for all then tillich would say that's a that's a you know that's that's a good form of religion that's ultimate concern so what he makes a distinction where, yeah are you held together by something that is material um or are you held together by a by, by something like justice or love or democracy that cannot be, as soon as you say what democracy is, it's not democracy. Right? Democracy is a, is we know kind of what democracy is, but, but, as, but we can never fully define it. And so, yeah, I like what you're saying. And I think then we can say that you can, you can actually make a distinction then between religions like, uh, like a nationalism that is a kind of like, in Tillich's terms, a demonic religion and a religion of, uh, the, the pursuit of justice, which holds people together. Yeah, that reminds me a lot of something that I had just been reading recently. Um, so this is like clicking. I was, uh, I'm reading the Zizak book and he's talking about uh, ideology, like modern day ideology. And he says that like sort of, you know, once upon a time, there was the, the primary mode of ideology that there was this sort of mystical story that people believed it or, or or they kind of um you know sort of foreclosed their disbelief in it but today we all kind of know ideology when we see it right and we sort of almost just cynically recognize like yeah okay we know that the slogans and all are are really crap but he says the the primary mode of ideology today is what he called like a fetishistic disavow the idea is that we'll all claim, yeah, we know it's ideology. We know that this is all just kind of a smokescreen and we don't really believe the story, but we'll hold on to something, some item that allows us to continue 
acting as if we believed in it. He talked about like um, an, an old man whose wife passed away and he was able to say, oh yeah, she died. You know, I understand completely. But they realized he was always holding a hamster when he was talking about it. Um, and he was able to just sort of matter of factly talk about his wife dying. But then once the hamster died, he was faced with the full reality of, of the situation and just broke down. And so his, his point was that ideology functions in this way. And I just thought that that really connected with what you guys were just talking about. Yeah, no, 100%. And, you know, I saw with a, a friend of mine many years, 20, 30 years ago, he died tragically. And the parents kept his room just the way it was before he died. And in some ways, uh, the father was so stoic in the face of this loss, but, uh, well, yeah, we were kind of stoic, but also just dead inside. But when they took the room apart, finally, when they, you know, finally did that, this flood of emotion came in. Yeah, and so that the room in a way was a yeah, fetishistic, uh, object that was able to somehow prevent the person from feeling. Um, yeah, I, I, the example I love, because I find this hilarious, is we all know about placebo. You go into a chemist and you see two drugs. They're exactly the same, but the drug that is advertised and, you know, and you've seen on TV, et cetera, is more effective than the home brand, even though they're exactly the same. But then they went ahead and did a study where they tell you this, right? So you go into the store and you know they're exactly the same. And still the more expensive one that's advertised is more effective. <laughs> you know, you know it's exactly the same and yet the placebo still works. Yeah, that's ideology today. Ideology is we know that, that having that fancy car will not, you know, fix everything, but we somehow act still as if it does. <laughs> I've been uh, intrigued for some time now getting uh, back to the kind of relation between religion and <clears throat> the structure of subjectivity, you know, especially as kind of explicated by Lacan, you know, in the psychoanalytic um, treatment. And I, I think I've just, I, I'm very interested lately in a, a possible reconciliation of uh, a, a true kind of transcendence, a religious orientation um, that truly is transcendent. Um, but is also reconciled to this notion of a lack that is that does determine the, the that does determine the self and subjectivity. So, for example, um, you know, it, it, can we can we move can we recover a religion that is not just one of many um, attempts to overcome the lack? Is there a religion? that does recognize an element of a subject that can transcend itself, a subject that is necessarily constituted by the lack. There is a necessary determination of the lack to subjectivity itself, it, you know, as such, but also a subject for whom the lack is not the final word, a subject that can actually kind of transcend transcend itself and so i don't know pete if you have any thoughts on that but i'm, I'm very interested in anyone that is able to <laughs> remain a lacanian uh in a sense <laughs> but um but is also interested in in true in, in a true transcendence like religion at its best yeah right not not religion as a as an attempt among many to <clears throat> fill the lack um, to, to satiate desire. Um, so I feel like, uh, I, don't, I don't know, I, I don't know if you would point, point us to anyone, you know, in that direction or what your thoughts are on that, but coming off of many years of Zizek and Lacan in, in your work, <laughs> that's kind of where I'm, where I'm starting to find my, myself kind of inquiring. Yeah, no, that's great. And that's, that's very well articulated because like, you know, this is what we're trying to do. This is what parotheology is. And I know for those of you who are involved in my Patreon, we go very deep, you know, and we do wrestle with very deep topics and hopefully not all the time, you know, but we do do that. Uh, but I guess that's sometimes what happens is we want to, this is a new, this is a movement that, that I want to see really um, expand out. And, you know, obviously I wouldn't be doing it otherwise, 
Uh, and it is about a religion that is able to have practices that enable us to enjoy this transcendence, this lack, without trying to, as you're saying, fill it, trying to get rid of it, but somehow celebrate that. And I think that we can very much read the best of religion in that way. That's beside the point you articulated that very well. Um, if I, what I hear you saying is, is there a way of doing that? And, uh, you know, retaining something that is also within traditional Christianity of a substantive transcendence. If you're saying that, I, the best person I think of is Soren Kierkegaard. You know, I think that's what potentially he was doing. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe we should do some book studies on him. Um, I was actually thinking about that. I've been thinking about maybe doing some like chapters out of one of his books, because I Peter, think- how many years are you going to promise that? I feel like we're on year three or four of the- uh, You know me, every time, I, I always <laughs> promise things I don't deliver. I, that's my thing. We should do this X, Y, and Z. Oh, um, oh yes, you have to hold Here's me the tools on teaching is about luck. <laughs> yes, exactly. I, I'm on like a reading break right now. I'm guessing you're gonna like this is the time you're gonna do it right when I'm unable to read. Yes. You'll just do it now. I think the window is open week. for you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, next week we begin. Oh you no, know, um, that is a that's very true. I was I was um reading a little bit of concluding on scientific pro postscript recently. So maybe I'll do that whenever you're off your reading. When you're back onto your reading, we'll do Kierkegaard. Right, I promise. <laughs> Kyle, I feel like I really like the essay, um, Freud's essay, remembering, repeating, and working it through, because I feel like it gets to this kind of idea of transcendence or rebirth or like life after death. I don't know if it's like overcoming the lack, but it is this place of like going from being stuffed to being alive again. So like to me, that's where I, I kind of go a lot when I'm thinking about like the religious element, the transcendent religious element. I don't know if that's useful. You know, I missed the very first bit of what you said there because I was reading Celeste's question in the chat box. So I just, what? Oh, Freud's essay, um, remembering, repeating and working it through. I think it kind of gets to that orientation towards the lack that is like about invigorating desire and, and rebirth by kind of going through this process that is kind of a religious process of working through these traumas and yet maintaining desire going forward, not getting like locked up, but then all this new rebirth happens in that place. So it's orienting towards like new life while also like having desire be part of that. And I don't know if that goes against what you want, um, Kyle, with like transcendence, but to me, like that's that's where I kind of orient my thinking towards like the religious um, place of it in that essay. I mean, one of the, you remind me there what you're saying is uh, one of the things I most appreciate about McGowan's work that um, I guess it was always implicitly there, but he said it so well <laughs> that I kind of, kind of saw it but I didn't see it before is, is one of the reasons why our contemporary consumerist society works is because it gives us what we want which is not, it doesn't work, right? That's, that's why it's, it's, you know, people look for why we're so drawn to a certain form of consumption when it doesn't work. You know, when you go like, no, that's precisely the reason why we're drawn to it, because we're always drawn by what doesn't work. We're always drawn by, like this is like in a relationship, why do you always fancy the person who doesn't fancy you? Right? You know, you know, oh, this person likes me and I'm not interested, but that person doesn't, right? you know, it doesn't always happen, but you know, that kind of motif is we're, we're often, it's, it's the not working that, that draws us. The problem is that the system, that is an enigma to us, it happens behind our back. It, it kind of always promises satisfaction while giving us dissatisfaction, which is what we really want. So how can, yes, we have a religion and an economic system that can embrace and enjoy not having. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna read Celeste's question here as well. She, she had to jump off the call, but wanted a little bit more information. She says, of course you have to jump off the call, but would you mind talking a little bit more about how this influence of the lack of the other creates desire. 
and how others therefore are influencing our desires, beliefs, sense of self. Uh, oh, versus Lewis's Bulverism. I always loved that essay in Bulverism <laughs> and, and its inaccuracy. Not sure that made any sense. Sorry, thanks. Oh, brilliant. That makes total sense. I, the last bit, um, let me just add on how others therefore influence their desires, beliefs, versus Lewis's Bulverism and its inaccuracy. Oh, yeah. Um, so, Bulverism was a very clever uh, word that C.S. Lewis invented for anybody who doesn't know, where he said that uh, in contemporary society, there is this idea that's everywhere, like ubiquitous almost, that where you go like, your truth is your truth, my truth is my truth, you know, and, you're si and what you say is a product of where you grew, grew up or your gender or whatever. And he said, Lewis said, I can't figure out where this came from. Like, there's no great thinker of this idea, right? There's no, there's no great uh, kind of philosophical argument for why this position would, would exist. So he made one up and he said, this guy, Bulver, I can't remember his first name. It's, they say Clive Bulver. And um, he said, uh, you know, he, kind of, so he makes up a figure and he calls it Bulverism. And, um, uh, and then he kind of critiques it. So that's Bulverism, but I'm not, um, I'm going to stick with the first part of this question for now um the influence of the lack and how it creates desire how others therefore influence us the funny like that my talk in two weeks ago we, we, you know on you know what does what does a woman want um i do see like when i look on instagram i do like what 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 freud was talking about seems to play out so much in that guys are more sedimented generally as I say in their desire um I saw a, a, a woman on Instagram talking about how she was going like, you know, what personality will I have for this group of friends? And I think she was also saying like the disaster that happens when two groups of friends of whom I'm two different people come together and then who am I going to be? Because, you know, for that group of friends, I'm one thing, for this group of friends, I'm another. So, oh crap, they're all coming together. I don't know who I am. <laughs> um, and that, that, that experience um is not solely connected to being a woman um, but it might be connected to kind of the feminine structure um which is as, as much more of a feeling of how in social environments who you're with um influences um who you are so to such an extent that you can even dress up in different ways and kind of act in very different ways uh that's a that's just a very concrete example of how it works. Like that's not a good theoretical example. It's a good concrete example of going if if someone if 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 you whoever you are watching this um are that type of person, you might go, oh yeah, I felt that. I I felt that um, even my my interests have changed in relation to who I've gone out with or who I hang out with. Um, I used to think that I hated philosophy. And then I started hanging out with these idiots on my Patreon and now I look at me. I'm kind of thinking about this. I'm buying Darian leader books and looking at, you know, whatever it is, you know, it's like, you know, you're going like, this is, this is crazy. I was never going to be interested in that before, but in one sense, the desire of the people that you respect and like um, influences you. Um, and the trick of it is there's no substantive other. So hypothetically in this setting, I might symbolically be the, the substantive desire right? Because this is my Patreon. So there can be a kind of fantasy that I have a desire and I know exactly what I want and I'm not caught up in that process. So maybe, you know, somebody might look to me and go, okay, Pete's desire and what he, what his attention alights on might be the thing that kind of really is substantive and right. And of course, part of this is going, I know we're all caught in the same matrix. However, we all have people that that help us to see that and help us in our journey. And I hope that I can help you as some of you help me, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so yeah, that's what that's maybe given a little bit more of a concrete example of how what we desire is influenced by the other's desire. And then I'll just say one thing again. I mentioned fantasy that that there's a certain extent in which everything's about recognition for Hegel. Like, so if you want to be rich, it's, it's not because you want to be rich. It's it's you want to be recognized that that gives a certain social status, or you want that car, you want that partner, you want that dress, you want whatever it is. That, it's not just the object. There's the recognition that that object could give you, 
and recognition in a particular person's eyes or people's eyes. Maybe it's the people at school who bullied you. Maybe it's your parents. Maybe it's whoever it is, your siblings, that to a certain extent, there's recognition is intertwined into our desires for things. And it's not that it's, it's just as that, like having money is great because you can go on holidays, you can do whatever, right? But but there's something more than just the just the use value, what Marx called use value, which is, you know, what something is valuable for. There's always something more than use. There's a surplus value. Um, and the surplus value is a value that is over and above the use value. Um, uh, and in, in, a, in a psychoanalytic sense, there's a surplus desire. There's desire for things and there's a surplus desire for the recognition of the other. That's that. And I'm not 100% sure how that fits with Bulverism, so I would need to hear you talk about that, but I think you've gone. So, um, go. But then Alison jumped in. So is desire exclusively performative in order to gain the respect and adoration of others? Um, you know, I, I, that's, that's interesting. Performative, you're using that probably in a technical sense of Butler, because the first thing I thought is, well, it's not performative in the sense that it's... Um, it's and it's not essentialist either, right? If you've got those two, essentialist is it's 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 substantive. You are who you are. Performative is it's something that you can uh, uh, you perform, right? It's not essentialist. Um, I would like to, and she's like talks about. This, I'd like to kind of like find a way of saying it is a type of inessential essentialism. <laughs> um, your desire um, is experienced as essentialist, but it's not. But anyway, but yeah, but, but I like what you're saying here, but second bit as well. In order to gain respect, adoration of others. Yeah, I mean, it sounds so reductive to say this, but, but there are some people who interpret Hegel as this is basically his main point, but is that, is that yeah, at, at its core, what we want as creatures, as human beings, is, and what we are, is we are intertwined with others' desire. And so there's always recognition and I mean, so respect and adoration. I, I could actually move away from that because there's lots of people who want the opposite, right? There's people who want um, to be mistreated and they, they, they do want to be adored. They want to be hated, right? Um, they get off on that. Um, but that's because maybe when they were young, um, they're, uh, so an example I, I, I talked about where this a friend who his sister and her, her, his sister and her friends would always, he was younger, would go up to the door and knock on the door and want to get in. And his sister and her friends would always kind of say, no, 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 you can't come in, but they'd be giggling and laughing. Right. So, and then they might let him in, but then they would kind of want to embarrass him. Right. So what he was doing was he was going like, I don't know what they want but they seem to enjoy kind of humiliating me, embarrassing me, right? So you're, so the, then the enjoyment of replay, not an adulthood, nothing wrong with that either, but they of kind of going of enjoying being ridiculed. So at the core of that is still recognition, right? The core, so, so even more basic than respect and adoration, you could say recognition as in how do I fit in the desire of the other? That's, that's the core, that's the key. And it's and this is why we're not utilitarian because we're actually not looking for respect and adoration necessarily. We're not necessarily looking for what benefits us, um, but we're looking to answer the question: What does the other want of us? And if the other wants something bad of us, if the, our parents only seem to want us to feel when we're kids, our parents don't want us at all when we're young we might find ourselves replaying that in a relationship. Um, we want to not be wanted. Because again, weirdly, that was the way that, that we gain the recognition of the other, if, uh, if that makes sense. Oh, Amy says, is there a cure for the desire quest of surplus value? Yeah, that's, that's where I'd say no. Like I would, I would go like, the, the cure is there is no cure. The cure, actually, the whole thing is desire and surplus desire and surplus value is inherent to being human. It's inherent. You cannot satisfy your desire, except it's always satisfied in, 
in not getting. So the, the, the trick is enjoying what you don't have. And Todd, Todd McGowan has a book called Enjoying What You Don't Have, which is a way of, which is what Simone Bay meant by the miser. The miser was enjoying his treasure. He was enjoying what he didn't have. And it's, it's funny that Simone Bay takes such a negative character as the miser. And of course she says, the Christian, so for her stomach, the Christian, the Christian is not the miser. The Christian is the one who has but has but has a similar structural or has the same structural relation as the miser, right? Both having and not having. Um, the problem for me with confessional religion is it promises a cure to desire. And that's what secular religions do as well. They promise a cure to desire. When for me, it's it's the the cure is to enjoy desire as such. Hey Pete. Hey. I can we jump back to the liberalism idea really quick? Um, so it's kind of like if we're dropped into a culture of liberalism, that that's what's going to enculturate us. Yes. And we're going to be saturated with the desires that liberalism puts into you. Um, and it was kind of that liberalism has the idea of atomization. You said democracy, but I think popularism is probably the better term. Like what's good for the most amount of people. And then probably like a meritocracy sort of thing in there. Like oh, yeah, the yeah. experts deserve the authority. Uh, if we were to take that and like rework that into what is it that we want to culture people with then? Like what is the, what's the radical or pyro, pyro culture or those, those assumptions, the grounds that we were trying to instill? Yes. That's part one. Way. I had to uh, move to plug my computer in, so as so you see the planet on the TV from the Apple planet. Um, yeah, that's very good. Yeah, we are enculturated into liberalism, so you're absolutely right. So that means that atomism is kind of the philosophy that we don't even we don't even think we think through. It's the glasses we wear. You're absolutely right. globalism, meritocracy, all hundred percent. So yeah, your sense of what 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 are we trying to? In, in incarnate or in culture as an alternative to that is that the question yes yes, yes. and also like how uh, to do this this is the other reason why i believe in institutions and this is why although i have to do this again i haven't done it for a long time is that trying to create communities weekly communities or, or get churches to start to imbibe these ideas is because if we want to start to imbibe a different kind of like uh experience we have to have rituals we have to invite people into an alternative world a world where this, these ideas these different ideas are being imbibed and that for me is a church the church becomes a place where every week you go and you performatively enact something different from from these values of say atomism um and and, and so the answer for me is exactly what we're doing here but it's like even what we're talking about is going like is realizing that we are intertwined that my desire is connected to the desire of the other is a critique of the liberal view of atomism but but church is the place where you don't just talk about it we don't do this we somehow have rituals that that enact it music art that um and, and preaching preaching is where you have great examples and great parables that that imbibe these ideas um so maybe I'm taking your question. I've kind of changed it slightly to go like to have a justification of church yeah. as an institution. <laughs> um, you're you're answering the second question, which would be like the pasteurization problem. Like you have to pasteurize your fluid to get rid of all the what's already enculturated it in order. And so you're saying the the cold the church is going to do is going to function in that role role of like purifying it so that you can culture it properly. Yeah, I love that analogy of pasteurization. I'm, I mean, I'm almost thinking like we're trying to pasteurize, like we're trying to purify what the message should be, and then we can create communities that do it well. So I love that analogy because I feel like um, I feel like the reason why I take so much time on theory is there is a different form of doing church life. And if we don't kind of like get the pure idea of what that looks like, we're not going to be able to enact it. So, but so we have these we have these communities that are trying to break down that idea of atomization and bring in like the community mindedness. But what about those other those other ideas like the meritocracy, the the um, 
the popularism and the uh, globalization, though, or I guess that's more like the the universal, like that everything is universal yeah, rather than I, particular. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I would say, and that these are a great question, which you know we'd wrestle with for a long time, but it's a great <laughs> question. I mean, off the top of my head, or very quickly, but I believe this is that the main role of the church is not to directly actually touch on any of those things, except the one thing, the thing that I think parotheology, anyway, a practice of parotheology is trying to hit on is the idea, is the experience of a self-divided God, of a self-divided absolute, of, of, a, of, of the sense that desire is not something that is overcome in a substantive way, but desire um, is something that we have to directly embrace. We have to enjoy what we don't have. We we experience the enjoyment of antagonism itself and asymmetry. Now, I say that and I go, that's at the core of the critique of all of this. Like once, if you think contemporary society, one of the main problems of contemporary society is what we've talked about previously, the God or the demand to enjoy, that when you go on Facebook, when you go on Instagram, there is a constant demand to enjoy, to be satisfied, to have, to have an excess, to, there's promises, all these self-help, all these gurus. I just found out this week, there's one from Belfast who's doing very well. I, call him, I can't remember her name, but you know, uh, you're selling all the answers, right? If, if one says that that is a problem, and the, one of the main problems with it is it generates jealousy, envy, self-hatred, anxiety, where it generates all of these kind of cacophony of modern ailments then embracing a type of lack and not having is an act of economic political cultural critique at a very incarnational level like if we ultimately realize that we can't buy ourselves to happiness and if if enough of us did that the system wouldn't work. The system works purely because uh, it was Kylie who said this. Uh, um, it worked kind of not because we believe um, that that we can buy ourselves to wholeness, it's because we act as if it does. And we 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 engage in it, and the system works not because of our beliefs, but because of our material investment in it. And so the church becomes the place in which we become libidinally disinvested in uh, a worldview and an idea that whether we get God or the Ferrari, we're going to be happy. Um, do, is that is that switch, once that switch happens, does that, um, is that like what needs to happen in order to start answering the other pro problems? Like we're using more energy than we can. Like our, our society is over, overusing energy or like gasoline or whatever. And that's leading to the destruction of our environment or um, the masses are downtrodden. Like, are, is it that we can't address those issues properly until we get to this proper view of the lack or this proper understanding? It yeah, brings us okay. to the point where we could do something about it. Yeah, and absolutely. So Freud has an essay called Wild Analysis. And in, that, in a part of that essay near the end, he says that, he says, the reason why you don't give knowledge to people in analysis, now there are forms of counseling that do, et cetera, and self-help that does, but in analysis proper, you don't give knowledge, even if you know it, even if you're like this person shouldn't be going out with this person. They should be, they should divorce that guy, right? But absolutely. And the analyst knows they should divorce that guy. And it's obvious to everybody. Um, Freud basically says, well, it's also obvious to them, right? It's like, if but they can't do it, right? They can't do it. Like if, and so knowledge, Freud basically goes knowledge and interpretation is, it's not completely useless. I and mean, he has a really good insight in this, but it's, it's, it's not very valuable. It's not the important thing. When someone is healthy, they don't need advice, right? When someone is healthy, you kind of nine times out of 10 know the right thing to do. You know, like in poker, I'm a poker player. You know when you should fool them when you shouldn't most of the time. You just don't, right? You just you 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 you, know, you have the knowledge, but you still stay in the hands because you think I'm going to win. So, um, Freud does say, however, that when the person is on the verge of 
being able to embrace knowledge, to embrace an idea, they're on the verge of it, then you can say it, right? Then the knowledge might help. Right at the verge where they're, they're almost, they're able to take the advice, then knowledge has some value. Now, the reason why I'm saying all of that again is, one, the church yeah, is not about giving knowledge about global warming or anything like that. That's what we have to do, do research, look at science, whatever. But at best, if we can create a community where we are healthy enough to be able to ask questions about, say, global warming, in which we're not libidinally invested in finding the answer we want or invested in some damaging drive related thing. So, yeah, so the church basically is about trying to help. It's almost like virtue theory where you go to you plant a tree in good soil, it will make good fruit. Right. If you if you create an environment where people are able to um, uh, I'm trying to connect this with this disinvestment with <laughs> with the substantiality. But if if you create a healthy community where people are open to the other and not invested in a particular answer, then yes, then you, the church doesn't need to give the answer to something. And it can't. I mean, good grief. The pastor's not an expert in everything. Um, does that, do you want to come back on that? I think, I think I'm waffling, but we're on the edge of an insight. Um, uh, it's, yeah, it's supposed like this. Um, if, if you are healthy, if, you, if, you're, if you're free from the belief that, as an example, free from the belief that purchasing <laughs> things is the answer and will, will somehow satisfy, get rid of your anxiety, you're kind of freed from that you're able to kind of embrace the struggle of life to a certain extent and not having, then I don't have to tell you that consumerism is destroying the planet. I don't have to tell you that. And you don't, you, yeah. actually, you might still believe it. You might still believe, you might still be, a, you know, believe in capitalism as an ideology, et cetera, et cetera, but you're not invested in it. Right? You're not, you're not libidinally invested. That's why it's like, it's not about believing whether capitalism is good or bad. There's lots of people who believe it's good, but they're not capitalists. There's lots of people who believe it's bad, but are, right? And that, that sounds weird at first, but it's completely the case. Um, just as, oh, I had a really good example there. And it was not in my head, but it's, oh, Jesus. <laughs> um, it, the atheism of Christ on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Is an existential death of God. It's not an intellectual death of God. In fact, Jesus and Christ still believes in God. So it's not, a, it's not a new atheism in which you stop believing in God in your mind. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Is not the absence of God intellectually. It's the absence of God existentially. And this is why Shizek says, new atheists still believe too much. Which is a Nietzschean idea, which is a lot of new atheists stop believing in God, but then commodity satisfaction, psychedelic enlightenment, sexual liberation, you know, you name it that becomes the ersatz God, the, the way of fulfillment. Christian, Christian atheism is an existential event in which you, in your body, feel the loss of God. You can still believe in God or not, doesn't matter. You existentially undergo the death of God. So in other words, you, don't, you, can, you can believe in capitalism or not, but you can experience the loss of its libidinal power in you. And enough people who do that, things can change. I wanted to say something about the the image that you spoke about in the beginning with the Russians looking through the hole rather than having icons. I think that's so powerful. And after you said that, I was just thinking about, are there other dimensions of religious practice or art that also show something similar? Um, and I was thinking of, um, oh, now I'm gonna get nervous, I forget. I was thinking of, um, in Zen Buddhism, there's the, in the calligraphy as spiritual practice, there's the, the circle that's drawn and it's emptiness that's there. Um, and then in Judaism in the Holy of Holies in the temple, you know, no one can go in there. Um, it's set apart um, and only, you know, the, it can only be entered once a year, I think on Yom Kippur. Um, and only by one person, the high priest. And then um, thinking about, um, I was thinking, what would it be in Christianity? 
um but maybe the empty tomb just the the emptiness there the empty tomb um and then if you've ever been this isn't religious but and it's not about lack it's just about inability to to access but if you've gone to a botanical garden and they have a japanese garden there what i love about this is you know the gardens that have the island that has beautiful trees on it um but you cannot go there you're not allowed to go there no one can go there um and i've always loved that and i don't know what that represents but i i've always loved that um i'm just trying to think about you know images that capture the lack that you speak of. Who was Can I jump in with a quick thought there? Yeah. I was thinking of the Roman Catholics practice of confession, right? Where I, I must I must orient myself toward uh, <laughs> a lack in myself that maybe has no content. But it's the, the it's the idea that in confessing to the priest, in, in the orientation of confession um, of towards my lack, there is a productivity. Even if I have no idea what I'm going to confess, or if I, you know, it is, um, uh, I don't know, I, I, you were wondering about where that could be in Christianity. That was the first thought that came to my mind was um, the practice of confession for the Catholics. Very good. These are great examples. I love it. I was, as soon as you start talking, uh, Tara, I was like, yeah, I can't think of any other examples. I thought you were going to say it's hard to find them, but you just named a pile of them. <laughs> um, and in fact, it reminds me that, um, you know, she's ex- like if you if you had to boil it down and he'd probably say different things at different times at one point you have to boil down what christianity is he would say that that in judaism you know in the temple where you say the priest can go in once a year it's an empty room and christianity all christianity does is in a sense kind of like show the empty room so it's it's kind of it's a it's a continuation on the Judaism with the temple curtain ripping. So the temple curtain rips, and now we all see <laughs> that there's nothing there in the Holy of Holies. Uh, so it's kind of almost like he says, like, it's the secret of Judaism for everybody, which kind of connects with Paul almost saying, like, you know, this is for the Gentiles as well as the Jews. It's like, this is, we're, we're, we're exposing the lactose for all to see. Um, yeah, thank you. I also thought of one more in Islam, the Kaaba, the the um the stone uh, cube at, at Mecca that is um that is circumambulated in prayer is empty I believe because it used to be full of idols and then Muhammad cleared that out um yeah oh wow very good yeah so my um like my 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 favorite I'm very proud of this uh, interpretation of a Bible passage because i don't do that very much you don't hear me talk about the bible very much but as you know i see through a glass darkly you know when we where paul says that you know i see through a glass darkly then i will see face to face um i will know as i am known uh and the two traditional ways of reading that are conservative reading is that the bible is seen through the glass so basically that that there's a dark glass we don't really know what's behind it but the Bible is the type of the, where we see clearly through Christ, whatever. And then the more progressive idea is that we see through it glass darkly in this life, but maybe in the future we will, you know, see clearly, you know, when we, when we, on the other side. Um, but a, a possible interpretation is that, that, uh, that yes, we do see through a glass clearly now i would say like the revelation so i'm more conservative in the sense of like something happened that we can see clearly what can we see clearly we can see clearly that there's nothing to see right so whenever there's a dark glass you always assume there's something behind it like if you find a, a safe you're going to assume there's something precious and right? um so the dark glass is the temple curtain right so there's a temple curtain and you're imagining behind the temple curtain obviously something amazing so the temple curtain rips and then you see clearly there's nothing to see. So the, the Christian revelation in Christ is that, that we see through a glass darkly, and then we see clearly that there is nothing. And it says in an exercise, we will, we will know as we are known. And I connect that with the idea that we are, when you really know someone, you know that they are not knowable. When you know someone, you know that there's a dimension of them that cannot be known. So, anyway, so that, that's, that's for me the radical moment of Christianity is it's the, it's the revealing of that secret. That, but it's, but when when it's not clear and a very po a big an analogy for me is in church if someone is in the pew 
and they're imagining, oh, if only I read my Bible more, if only I prayed more, if only I volunteered more, then I'd have the answer. And then we imagine they eventually do that. They do it all. Then they see clearly that there's nothing to see, right? Once they get to become the pastor and they get behind. So before they get to the elders room, they think, oh, the elders, they're all having cappuccinos with Christ in there. You know, they're praying. The angels are, you know, coming to the elders and talking to them. But when you get into the eldership meeting and you're all arguing about what to do with the tithe, you're like, oh, now I see no, I see clearly. Uh, I see clearly there's nothing to see. But that's the point of salvation. <laughs> that's the point when you can embrace that. And that's the, the success that comes from failure. So the first is the failure that comes from success. You successfully get to the elders room and there's a radical failure. And then you embrace the failure. And then you, that leads into a radical success. Peter, that is at the end of a passage on love. Oh, yeah. You know, so I, I mean, that, that's the way I've always seen that in that it is in the fulfillment of love that we that, that that is fulfilled. Sorry, I just 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 the way of my thoughts about that particular yeah. passage of seeing darkly. And, and it's in love that we start to actually understand, start to see, start to uh, realize that that we're seeing more clearly. Mm -hmm. about the nature of humanity the nature of ourselves to begin to accept ourselves and love ourselves and accept the other and love the other yes and, and if, that's yeah and, and if, if like you know you absolutely and if if you take a kind of like a, a lacanian definition of well, love's almost impossible to define or whatever but actually i think <laughs> it is possible to define it lacan in a very in a nutshell kind of says you love someone when you when you orient yourself to their lack when you to love is to love the other in their desirousness and vice versa and so that all connects with, with what we're talking about yeah I, it's it's a non-materialistic thing and and the thing i keep hearing when you when when talking about desire is a is a materialistic desire a, a, a transactional desire and yet love is almost the opposite of that yeah. it's not a transactional thing it's not it's not something that 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 you have to give to get or get to give it is mm. and that 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 uh, i'm not saying <laughs> yeah and uh, yeah so yeah it's this this business of, of talking in transactional language when we're talking about desire and when we're talking about love and, and fulfillment and i'm uh, sorry yeah you yeah. like the beard by the way oh sorry it needs trim it needs to trim <laughs> um the other thought i had was with regard to the one of the critiques that Jesus made in parables, and people read this differently, but I, but, but I say it in terms of the parable of the prodigal son, you had one son that went off out of his desire, out of his desire to fulfill himself, who, who actually saw his, his position somewhere else and wanted to exchange his desire uh, and fulfill his desire somewhere else. And uh, I said, you know, the, the parable goes on to say, you know, he spent all of his money and then came back because he realized that, you know, maybe I can fulfill myself there. But then there's the other son who said, why are you celebrating the return of, uh, of, of you know, why, why do we need, why do you never celebrate? And, and God's answer, or the father figure in this case is, you've always been with me. There's mm -hmm. never any desire. It's not about desire. It's not about fulfillment. It's not about uh, materialism and capitalism and fulfilling our desire. It's the fact that you've always been there. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, you're, you're 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 about to pull me off into uh, a reading of the prodigal, which is um my favorite reading of the prodigal is uh, Kester Bruins one where he, but I won't get into that. But we'll do that another, <laughs> another time. time, another time. Yeah. Sorry, because <laughs> I realized that we we went out of time. Oh, brilliant! But I do love um. Sorry, I just Courtney mentioned something very interesting. But part of my journey was a horrific disillusionment that came with being a Christian missionary for six years and seeing behind the scenes more clearly. That's it. Yeah perfect example and loads of people who come to this place where we are have had a similar experience to that Courtney is that's why I often say is that the people who find power of theology are not not the ones who kind of sit back in a lukewarm way about religion it's it's the all of the idiots who went full into it <laughs> who burned their records and and gave all their money and went to missionary and went to Tajikistan and did all we are the we're the crazies who went all the way and only when you go all the way, well, it's 
the main thing is like that's when you encounter this radical conversion this radical behind the scenes so that's a beautiful example of it is and that's what I've always loved about the crazies the misfits the fundamentalists that they go all the way and if you can go all the way you can break through um unfortunately some people go all the way and then they become the pastor and then they have to pay their bills and they have to you know they they get caught up in looking a certain way and then they you know they give up but uh but if you go all the way and you break through this it's as you say it's horrific disillusionment that's the nihilist the, the nihilistic moment of christianity is the is the horrific disillusionment where you see there's nothing there but then there's resurrection which is where you discover the secret is not an object that you love but the secret is a depth dimension in objects when you love and uh so yeah but and that's why you know you say i love that term horrific disillusionment because um i think that's what the death of god is like that's what it is existentially the death of god is a horrific okay. moment in which what you think will work will make you substantive will fix you won't it's horrific and if you haven't undergone existentially the my god my god why have you forsaken me the ex then i don't i don't think you enter into the new life and again that's a critique of new atheism whereas the one says oh god doesn't exist you know so what like this <laughs> it's, a, it's not an existential death of god that can then lead to resurrection um so yeah, uh, what you experienced there, I think, was was your was a conversion moment. Was that horrific disillusionment? Was this moment in which the success of you being a missionary for six years was a failure? But the failure then leads to the success. All right, that was wonderful. Thank you. It was really fun to see you all and have a conversation. Um, uh 25th there's going to be something in la um and uh there's lots of other things happening keep an eye on the calendar um and i will see you all again soon all right yeah that was excellent peter oh excellent. thank you thank yeah. you all yeah. right thank, thank you, you. Pete. Bye -bye.